but yeah, thank you for coming on such a, such a lovely lovely afternoon. I thought some people might have opted for the garden instead. I, I, I can see a few people are killing two birds with one stone, which is <laughs> which is great. Um, so I recruit across the BA market in Leeds, and as Corcom Consulting as a company, we've put these boss series of events together to bring the BA leaders in the space to kind of discuss hot topics and ideas um, and just really come together as a community to help each other out in the best way possible. Um, Jamie and Ali from DWP have kindly um, got a presentation for us. Um, the guys at AO have, have got, it's not a presentation, it's more of an interactive talking session, which is going to complement the presentation really well um, as well. So, so yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off with Jamie and Ali and I'll, I'll, I'll let you run from there. Smashing. Thanks, James. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Toyn. I'm head of business analysis at DDP Digital, um, although I am till Friday. And then from Monday, I'm at MOJ, Ministry of, Digital, Ministry of Justice Digital, but I'll still claim it as this for the purpose of all the marketing that James has put into it. Um, we didn't want to confuse things. Um, Ali, do you want to say a few words while I get the slides up? Yeah, so I'm Ali Yurovsky, I'm a um, practice lead business analyst um, in DWP. I'm not leaving on Friday, so um, <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, Jamie's abandoning me. <laughs> it, it wasn't Ali. Um, <laughs> right, cool. So hopefully everyone can see a blue screen. Well, not a blue screen of death, but just a blue screen slide deck star. Um, so, um, so we've come here today to talk to you all around a program we've been running internally um, and looking around how we develop um, our next generation of BA leaders. And when we say BA leaders, we mean senior business analysts in particular. Um, so, but before we do that, I'm just going to go, I guess, a quick sort of interlude into what DVP is and what DVP Digital is and, and into our BA practice. So um, DVP Digital, um, so it's Start with work and pensions. We've someone spent a lot of money on putting a logo together and putting digital on there, uh, which basically means all the people in DVP that wear Converse uh, and work as business analysts, devs, testers, delivery managers, product owners, and the usual type of roles you'd expect to find in the digital environment. Um, we're quite a sizable um, organization in our own right. So, um, DVP wide, we've got about 80 or 1,000 people across the UK. Uh, digital wide, we're about 4,000 ish now. Um, and as part of that, we've got 250 business analysts, which form our practice across the UK, um, across six hubs. Um, so one of those is Leeds, the other one is Sheffield, another one is Manchester. We've also got Newcastle and Blackpool, so really strong in the north. Um, and then we also have one in London as well, in Westminster. Um, so we spread across six subs, but obviously at the moment, realistically, we spread across 250 different people's homes in our BA community, and obviously 4,000 or so across um, across the full, you know the full breadth of digital. So what kind of things do we work on? Um, so we work on some quite high profile things. Um, so we work on universal credit and the rollout of that, um, which I'm sure some of you may have seen various documentaries on TV about. Um, we can't comment on any of that today, um, so um, we haven't got the right PR. Uh, license to do that. Um, but universal credit is one of our biggest things. We've also been looking at things like Kickstart to get people back into work um, after uh, COVID. Um, we weren't responsible for the Ballerina cyber security um, advert. That was another part of government. Um, but we were responsible in putting together a website in, in trying to support you know, people looking to reskill and move between different professions. Um, we also look at things like pensions. We look at things like health related benefits, um, child maintenance. Um, and a variety of other things which DVP look after. Um, so all in all, we've got about 100, well, over 100 of digital products uh, that we run. Um, and I think that's it on DVP really as a quick interlude. I mean, we can answer any sort of particular questions at the end, either in the Q&A or at the end of the presentation. So um, I'm just gonna skip on a slide. I think we've sort of covered one already. Um, so why have we developed the programme? So I'll hand over to Ali to cover the next couple of slides or so. So Ali, over to you. Yeah, so why have we developed it? So we're keen on um, obviously developing people within the practice. We've got a large practice, as James just said, 250 or so people, and we're always bringing in new people and doing recruitment. So we decided to run this. Partly, we were, bring, we were starting to um, run the level of apprenticeship around the same time. And we wanted to kind of have something else that we could give to um, 
our established BAs something to help them develop. So it didn't feel like it was all, all of the kind of training, learning, development was concentrated on the, the kind of newer, fresher faces into the organisation. So it's kind of the what about me? Kind of what about my development? So for us, the senior development, um, senior BA role is a really important one. So they kind of have quite a lot of responsibilities across um, particular functions and teams. They help develop some of our other BAs, the associates and the apprentices. So it's a key role um, for us. Um, so one of the things for us is we're really keen on developing within our organisation as well as bringing in new talent. Um, and as part of wanting to develop our own, we kind of wanted to have a look at what are the things that are kind of preventing some of our internal people reaching those senior roles. So we look back at some of our previous recruitment, um, some of the areas where people are typically fallen down. So we've got some really, really strong BAs, brilliant at um, analysis and all of the different BA techniques out there. But sometimes we were finding that people were falling down in specific areas, usually around leadership, around seeing wider than just the team that they were working on. Um, so we started to identify some of the areas where we thought we could make the most difference and help those people develop. Um, so also for us, I don't know about other organisations, but for us, it's kind of the biggest jump from what we class as a working level BA. So kind of a BA working on a typical team, a typical multidisciplinary team to then actually moving, making that move up to a senior business analyst, which for us can be somebody who works across a number of different teams or might manage a number of different BAs and works closely with um, the senior product managers. So it can be quite a step up, quite a, quite a difficult move if you're not quite sure what the role might be. Okay, we'll just move on to the next one. Yeah, is this me actually, Ali? Yes, it is. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so I think I need to touch on some of those bits already in terms of the importance of the senior BA role. But um, what we've got here is, a, a, I guess, a more detailed breakdown. I'm just going to talk for the next two or three slides um, in why it is so important in our organisation, in our community, and why we particularly uh, think there's a, there's, a, there's a big need to invest in that profession or that, that, that level within our profession in particular. Um, so, and this is in no particular order, so you'll, you'll see a number of different concepts we're exploring here and why it's important, um, but these aren't weighted in any particular way or, or, or ranked in any particular way. Um, but one of the things that we really expect from our senior BA, particularly given we have such a sizable community, um, we've also got a very large population of junior business analysts as well, um, so sort of north of 60 or 70 junior business analysts. Um, and we've just launched an apprenticeship programme, is actually growing and supporting others. And that's something we both use as a way um, to, you know, to help people who maybe only worked in civil service, for example, but they maybe worked in quite limited um, sort of ranges of, of sort of projects and products um, as a business analyst. Um, but also um, to leverage that experience that you have, given we've got numbers of people that come from a variety of different um, organisations, different sectors, um, different parts of the UP, different parts of government, different parts of the private sector, completely different industries, whether it's banking, automotive, um, insurance, um, cloud companies, you know, whatever that may be. So when we say grow and support others, we really look for our senior BAs to have a really active role in coaching others, mentoring, peer reviews, but also being that sounding board for people. Um, so if they've got something they're wanting to do for the first time, or if they're coming across a problem they've not come across before, or if they've got a particularly challenging stakeholder, or whatever it may be, they've got somewhere in a safe environment of, of, of a person they can talk to, um, who has probably been through those kind of things a few more times in the past. Um, similarly, we really look for our senior BAs to bring together not just people and growing support and others, but also bringing together disparate sets of analysis. So. In our digital part of organization, most of our teams are working um, in multidisciplinary teams, so in, in, a, in an agile setting. Um, and most of them are focused on particular features or particular products. But across our lines of business, we can have multiple different products or features are all working in one space. So we can have multiple different ones on universal credit, multiple different ones looking at our at retirement and, and pension. Um, sort of the benefit lines that we offer, could be looking at things like child maintenance, whatever it may be. Um, but what we actually need is someone sometimes to be looking a little bit just outside of that particular product uh, or feature space and, and bringing together those disparate 
sets of analysis, but also doing that not just to prevent waste and, and, and duplication, but also to identify gaps and to provide a better experience for our citizens, for our customers. And um, similarly, um, we have given we've got quite a large setup, tooling and artifacts obviously are really, really important for us, as they are for many organisations. Um, what we don't do as an organisation wide is mandate what every business analyst should be doing in every single area. We're all working on different things. We've all got different skills. We've all got different experiences. We're all working with slightly different pressures. Uh, we're all working with different people. So we don't say you must do this, this, and this. But what we look for our senior BAs to do is to collaboratively bring the teams of different business analysts together in one area and work out what's right and what's good for that particular area. So everyone's consciously contributing to that. It's something which is obviously best practice driven, of course, and is a, is a heavy promotion angle of, of best practice, but it's very much a collaborative activity and it can be refined and people can see what good looks like in the context of that thing they're working on. So if we need to be pragmatic on a particular technique, we can be pragmatic. We don't need to follow a book religiously. We don't need to follow a course, a technique learned on a particular course religiously. We can do that in a way which fits what we're working on, the skills that people are working with, um, that you know, the stakeholders are working with and various other things. So moving on, um, we also expect our senior BAs in particular, I mean, as all of our, as all BAs, but particularly our senior BAs, to be the advocates for our profession. So we, like most organisations, have got various different uh, professions, some are newer than others. So some of the newer ones like business architecture, service designers, um, we have dedicated user researchers. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a, a grey sort of blurring of, of where some of those roles work together and how they work together. So there's an advocacy piece there for what good looks like in our profession, but it's also demonstrating how it adds value, but also then works with some of those other emerging professions uh, or professions where um, if you're you know, looking through a sort of lens of a Venn diagram, it, it can be some crossover. Um, and we're really looking for our senior BAs to be championing that and, and particularly given some of the audiences and the sessions they're in, uh, they're some of, you know, they're typically the most senior people in the profession on, on what they're working on. Um, Similarly, as part of that, we really look to empower all of our business analysts, but particularly our senior business analysts, um, to select appropriate techniques to tailor what they're actually working on. So it's, it's going on to the previous point, really, about the, about the, the artifacts and the tooling. But we really um, invest in our senior BAs to not necessarily follow a strict mandated route. You know, if, if we need to be pragmatic, feel free to be pragmatic. Yes, use best practice, of course, and bear in mind best practice. But if we need to tweak things, if things can't be followed in a particular way and there's a better way of doing it, then feel free to try it out, have a go at it. Um, if it works, great. If it doesn't, that's fine. Let's learn from it and share how it hasn't worked and share it how it has worked outside of your area and inside of the area you're working on. Um, also, our senior BAs, as of to honest, all of our BAs, we really promote the concept of critical friend, which isn't a new thing. This has been around for a long time in the BA space. I'm sure many people on the call uh, will be very, very familiar with this as a concept. Um, but actually, as a BA, we really think that's an area that, you know, as business analysts, we add a huge amount of value. And it's something that's sometimes quite hard to describe. Um, it can be a little vague. What does, what does critical friend mean? Does it mean shouting at someone? Um, does it mean telling someone off? No, obviously it doesn't mean those things. Uh, but sometimes actually asking some of those questions that maybe people are afraid to ask or don't think to ask um, and really make sure we're focusing on what it is we're trying to do. What is the problem we're trying to, to you know, trying to solve? Does everyone really understand it? Is what we're trying to look to design and build really meeting the needs of our citizens, but also us as, a, as an organisation? So we've put this thinking around sort of business analysis, tyre kicking. We don't necessarily mean tyre kicking um, BA artefacts per se. Yes, is a part of that uh, peer review and everything else. Um, but really, it's more around working with parts of the organisation and being that voice of reason slash critical friend, whether that be with senior directors, whether that be with product owners, whether that be delivery managers, whether that be with anyone, such as policymakers. And in working in government, we have a lot of influence, obviously, by what policy is set within government. But quite often, sometimes when we work through that policy, sort of minute of that policy doesn't really work very well in reality. So part of our role is then to go back and be that critical friend with, with our policy makers as well. Uh, and that's something we're really looking for our senior BAs in particular, so given some of the conversations they might be able to get themselves into 
that maybe a, a BA working in very much focus on a particular product or feature might not have the bandwidth for even the opportunity to get involved in. Um, and then the last two, um, evolving the profession. Um, well, I think we all know that business analysis is constantly changing, the world really is constantly changing, digital is constantly changing, technology is constantly changing. And we really want our senior and lead business analysts to be a huge part of both inputting to what that looks like in DDP, but also across government and through events like this. Um, so we regularly encourage our BA community, and in particular our senior and leads, both to be a part of our internal events and having a leading role in those but also outside of DVP as well and then lastly community so we are huge advocates of communities of practice we very much bought into Emily Webber's uh, model of communities of practice I'm that probably familiar with many people if it isn't I'm happy to sort of go into questions at the end on it um, and it's something we actually sell as almost a, a, an attraction tool as well for people coming into the organization you can actually learn in this organization we've got that scale we've got that size and with that brings lots of opportunities to share individuals, people's um, experiences from both inside the UVP, but from also from outside the UVP. And also that then means things like building your own networks. It also then means like looking at, you know, getting you set up with the best mentors possible that can really support you and what you're wanting to learn or develop. And I think that's it for me on these first set of slides. I'm going to hand over to Ali next. <laughs> Um, just tell me to sound like a robot because my sound's going a bit funny. <laughs> okay, so next slide. Uh, program in depth. So the program is aimed at people who we class as working level BAs. So you, as I described you know, they BA who are doing your typical role with the team, so they're working on one particular piece of work. They'll be working alongside a couple more junior BAs or potentially another senior. Um, so we do a kind of the biggest group of people that we have and to a most of them. So the programme is aimed at people who are in that role. Um, they don't have to have been doing that role for any particular time. We kind of recognise that people do it in different speeds, in different ways. Some people feel much more ready for a senior role or others do. Um, some it's an experience that they might have had in terms of what they've worked on, where they've developed previous experience. So we haven't mandated in any way that people coming onto the senior development program have to have, for example, done five years as a working level BA or worked on a particular um, kind of team or area. So it's for those people who are particularly enthusiastic, um, who are keen to develop themselves. So that's one of the key things for us. They have to be keen to develop themselves. Um, whilst being on the programme, it's not kind of a case of we're going to teach you everything um, and you're just going to sit there and learn and at the end you're magically going to be um, a senior business analyst. So it's for people who want to self-develop um, and it'll also help them identify where their further development needs are. So we're not saying at the end of this, you're, you know, you will be the full package. Um, we've also asked people who are keen to do this for a time commitment. So it's not something that we kind of want people to just say, oh, I'll dip in one week, um, but next week I might be busy and might have something else on. So we want people to commit to that time scale of um, five to six months and actually give us that time each week. Um, so if there's a, a particular session on to come along to it, and if there's not, what are the other things that they can be doing to start um, their development? Okay, just next slide. Okay, so one of the things that we had to be really clear about when we set this um, development program up was expectations. So as I just mentioned, we wanted that time commitment. So we wanted that commitment for the full five months. So we didn't want people sort of dropping in and out, um, kind of going, I'll do a couple of sessions and I'll kind of move and do something different. So we wanted people to try and attend every session that we, we ran um, in order to get most out of the program. Um, if there's a topic that someone's thinking, actually, I already know quite a lot about that, we're encouraging them actually come along to it because a lot of our sessions are interactive. You'll learn from other people. We have a lot of discussion. We bring in um, people from outside the organisation to talk. So don't just kind of presume you know enough already about a particular topic, be open minded. Um, we wanted engagement as well. So that's one of the things that we set out to people. We didn't want people just to be silent attendees. Um, so we try to make our sessions interactive. But we really want people to actually use that name to engage and chat with each other. Um, we encourage them to engage outside of the program, so setting up team spaces, um, things like that. They can actually kind of ask questions or talk to each other. Um, engagement was a big part of it for us. Um, and the other thing around expectations, 
we wanted them to understand that this was a starting point. So this programme is going to help you identify some of the areas where you need to develop and might show you need to develop your leadership a bit more. We're not going to say after a couple of sessions that you're going to be the strongest leader, but actually you'll kind of know some of the things that you need to do, whether that's within your existing team or looking at new opportunities, but things that you can do to help kind of further that development. So for some people, they'll come to the end of this programme. We've got some people who midway through have actually already secured senior roles because they were almost at that point. And for others, it'll take longer. So kind of different time scales. So just an awareness, an expectation that you won't come out and there'll be a definite time scale or you'll definitely have um, a senior role within six months of finishing. It's different for everyone. So we need to be clear about that to start with. Okay, Jane. I think this one's usually sorry Ali yeah because they're all pink and I thought we'd just follow one scheme but we haven't so ignore me um I'll carry on then um so yeah so why do we develop in-house so I think for us obviously there's, there's lots of things in in the wider market that are aimed at developing new entrants into business analysis so one of the things we've just launched um in the last few weeks is the apprenticeship scheme so the one that's been around for three years or so which I know um, Tina Lovelock um, did a session on one of the BA bosses, I think it was three or so years ago when she was launching it. Um, and we're, we're launching that in DVP. We've got eight people on our first cohort. Um, we're looking to make this something we run, you know, two cohorts a year. And, and that, that, that lasts typically 18 months or so. But that's a very structured, externally accredited apprenticeship programme. And, and that's something that's been put together um really well it's something we really buy into and there's no point us trying to reinvent the wheel on that. that that's a brilliant thing in its own right but what we what there isn't anything available in the market is actually something which focusing on developing sort of the, the leaders in business analysis and, and those are some more senior practitioner levels so with nothing available we've really had to do this ourselves um so we we've done this using various bits of feedback so i think ali mentioned at the beginning um, we're looking at where people are failing on um on interviews for senior ba roles we're looking at some of those things where um you know it, it's quite a big step and actually if you haven't had the opportunity to work on in, in various ways or on various things it, it probably would be quite a big gap unless you had experience outside of dvp doing it or in, in a different role beforehand um so we've used a lot of that insight to build up this program um, but what we've, we've also done is, is used our contacts to bring in speakers from various organisations as well. Um, so we've got Close Brothers, um, we've got people from BT and EE, in fact Tammy on, on the call that was our first external speaker on the programme um, and is now signed up for life for the rest of this programme as it's run every uh, five months or so. Um, but we're using our network to bring those speakers in, to bring in different perspectives. So obviously um, we do a lot of things across government. Obviously government typically works in very similar-ish ways, even if you're outside DWP. But what we want to do is bring sort of the outside in, in terms of you know, academia, whether it be finance, whether it be telco, whatever it may be, to share their experiences. And also what we've seen is that people are sometimes more receptive as well. If you bring in an external speaker, um, it adds more of a buzz around it, as well as obviously someone talking that they're very different, um, in, in sometimes quite a different uh, way of speaking, but actually so a lot of those principles are obviously then very transferable. Uh, and Tammy's session actually, um, in particular, um, went down really, really well, and uh, we got a lot of good feedback on. Um, and this particular programme, this one we've developed in-house, is the first one we've run within RBA practice. Um, we, like I say, we are looking to, to learn from it and tweak it as we go along, um, but we are hoping to run this, you know, uh, again in the future. Um, we do have a lot of demand for more senior business analysts as our business gets more complicated, as our aspirations become greater, um, as we look to invest in things like apprenticeship programmes, we've got a bigger growing need for, for experienced practitioners um, who are not just experienced in business analysis techniques, but also in those other things that we need uh, to make someone a, a, a rounded leader in the profession. So the other thing we've sort of toyed around with is what about the size of the group? So we, we, we you know, we've over 100 or so um, business analysts, uh, working level business analysts, as we call them. Uh, so business analysts that aren't junior, aren't apprentices, aren't seniors, aren't leads. Um, we 
we we you know we were conscious we could easily get overwhelmed in terms of the number of people who are interested in applying um and also at the same time we had to balance that with yes we want to help as many people as possible but we've only got so many mentors uh, available on the program uh, we've only got so many people who can dedicate their time to really properly investing in someone um, through it we've only got so many uh, short-term sort of community projects we can offer out and we've only got so many um also there's only certain sessions particularly where they're facilitated with external guest speakers tend to work better in small groups and to get the most out of that you know what's the right size so we went with 12 um for, for this particular um this particular cohort I, so far we're thinking that's a good number where do you draw a line if you've got 13 people do you bring 13 in yes we would but obviously for us we had a lot more than 12 or 13 people apply so um but i think it's about being pragmatic but also being fair so we've got various criteria we're looking for um like ali mentioned as well earlier some people have already gone on uh, before they finish the program to seek and secure um senior ba promotions um in the organization um and one outside the organization actually as well elsewhere in government um, and that's great, um, but also got other people where it might be another couple of years before the secure a senior bay promotion, but this is about getting them um, exposed to some of the things they need to be focusing on to get them to where they need to be. So um, sharing the various pathways into the senior BA role. So the, the other thing that we spent a lot of time on doing, particularly at the beginning, was really promoting is not a one a one size root sort of fits all. Um, and I'm sure if we did a little survey on this call today, which we haven't, but probably would have been quite a nice thing to do, but maybe something for another time, um, is actually asking about how we all got into business analysis. And I'm sure most people's stories on this call would be very, very different. And we've all been, I'm sure, at many different events and heard from colleagues, ex-colleagues, people who are now outside of the organizations are working. There's not really a typical route into business analysis. Um, it doesn't really exist. Um, there might be a few people that have followed a very similar route, but there's, there's many, many, many different routes. And one of the best presentations I ever saw was at the European, Com European BA conference, where someone was a paramedic who went into business analysis and actually so many transferable skills that you wouldn't think were immediately obvious for someone from a paramedic background coming into business analysis. I'm not sure it goes the other way as well, but it, it certainly worked paramedic to BA. I'm not sure about BA to paramedic. Um, but what we did is looked at some of those people who've got inside our organisation, look at all different career paths that they've had to date. And we got, we got some of our existing seniors to share those um, with our community. And it's something that went down really well. We even had um, a funky sort of Star Wars one from one of our uh, senior BAs, Richard, that went down particularly well. Um, I think he invested a lot of time into making it snazzy. Um, it was very rich on sort of the graphics and the visuals. But I think the stories that came out for people was, wow, actually, yeah, there isn't a one size fits all. Yeah, you don't just do something and then you become a senior BA. You don't just, get a certain amount of years of tenure. We don't just pass so many certificates. We don't just go and work on a particular project, which is a certain size and, and that's it, you become one. There's lots of different things you need to pick up and, and equip yourself with along the way. And we really, really, like I say, wanted to emphasize as well that senior BA wasn't based on tenure. And I think we've had a lot of myths in our organization in particular around if you're a senior or a lead you've got to have done 10 years to become a senior you've got to be 15 years to become a lead or whatever random sort of science that people come up with and obviously people people develop in, in at different you know different speeds people have, have different experiences some people are more driven with their careers or people um, obviously have been more fortunate different opportunities you know there's a whole host isn't there a, a variety of different things which can influence how someone becomes ready or, or, or not ready or maybe not even interested um, in, in, in progressing to that next level. Um, so we really wanted to promote that. And I think that went down really well, given we had such a variety, such a richness of, of different routes in. And I think, Ali, it's over to you. It is. Yeah, so just on this, I'll just keep it brief on this slide. So just as an overview for our program, because we said that the program itself um, was open to, to BAs. Um, it's five months um, duration. Whether that's the right duration for, for the future, I don't know. We're, this is kind of a bit of a trial one. It's the first time we've run it, and we'll seek lots of feedback at the end to see what has and hasn't worked well. But we've tried on it for five months. I think it's probably enough time for people to get some good ideas, but not too long that it stops us running it too frequently because obviously we've got a lot of people who are interested so we wanted to kind of 
allow for running it potentially a couple of times a year. Um, as Jamie's mentioned, we've got a mixture of some courses, some guest speakers from other organisations and internally. Um, and we've got some also some internal sessions that myself and Jamie have run, some that the mentors have run, um, some that some other senior BAs have run, for example, one on visualisation that they ran um, a week or so ago. Um, another aspect of the programme is we're looking to get people who haven't had an opportunity before um, involved in some of our wider community initiatives. So it's one of those areas we kind of we look for in our seniors, people who can get involved in some of the community things and help develop other people. But quite often people don't know where to start with what to, to get involved in. And there's somebody else already doing that. What can I get involved in that's not already being done? So um, as part of the programme, we kind of discovered a few different initiatives that perhaps things that we haven't had a chance to do ourselves yet that, that they could pick up and run for us. So, for example, we've got a couple of people on the programme who are picking up um, organising um, a hub-wide, so across the six hubs, mentoring programme. So when people join us and they really want to find a BA mentor, then actually we can match them up with them. So it helps us because they're actually doing some of the things that maybe are on our backlog, but it also gives other people the opportunity to actually get involved in some of those things and have examples that they can use when they, they do want to go for promotions. Um, I've mentioned that we're asked for a time commitment from people, so it's around two to three hours a week. That's not all sessions, it's kind of community initiatives, it's sessions, or it's kind of um, their own self-learning. And Jamie's mentioned each participant has been matched with a mentor. So we had some really good volunteers from our senior um, community, our existing senior community. They've actually been really enthusiastic about mentoring others, um, I think for their own development, but also for some of them who are new in it's quite an experience sort of to mentor someone else who's up and coming. So lots of volunteers. Um, we got 12 in the end, um, which is great. It's allowed us to put that number of people through the programme. Um, and those relationships are going on for the duration of the programme. If they decide to continue them after, then great. Um, so that is the, an overview. So Jane, if you can just move on to the next slide. Okay, brilliant. So this slide is, literally this is kind of the content of the development programme in pictures. Um, because I like pictures. So we've covered all these things. So these are kind of the broad areas that we're covering. There are other aspects to it, but mentors, as I said, everybody's matched up with a mentor for the programme. Um, leadership was one of the key areas that we found people were struggling with demonstrating when they're coming to interview or it's something that people don't necessarily get an opportunity to to do um, within the BA role. Um, it's more as a step to senior, you suddenly need to be able to demonstrate that leadership and you suddenly have to know how. Um, so we've looked at kind of what leadership is, we've given them some resources to look at, um, had some sessions on what leadership is. So that's one of the key aspects of the programme. Another one, we haven't had the course on this yet, so I'm going to be interested to see what this is like, um, storytelling. Um, so as a senior BA, you often have to talk with your senior stakeholders and actually they're not really necessarily interested in some of the, the lower level analysis that we do. They kind of want to know what's the story you're telling me? What does this mean for me? Um, so this session's kind of looking at, as a BA, how do I get across that story to my stakeholders and the people who, who it matters to? So how do I tell them in a way that's going to keep them engaged? So that one should be interesting. I'll feedback on that one when we've had it. Um, Jamie's mentioned already the, the career pathways sessions so that was really useful just in terms of making sure people realize that we don't just have one route into to our career and everybody has a different um, background. Um, next one is around understanding the role. So we actually did this very early on on the program. We ran a session and it was a very interactive one with whiteboards around um, what is the senior BA role. So there's quite a lot of misunderstanding internally and externally so in other organizations a senior BA might mean something a little different to the way we structure it within DWP so in some organizations it might be the BA role but maybe just slightly more experienced in the, the techniques um, or in a particular subject matter for us it's very much around actually that leadership side of things and being able to see across a number of different areas kind of see what's coming in and, and how that might impact so we just wanted to get people's thoughts on what they thought the senior role was and then compare that to some of the thoughts of the existing senior BAs. So it was prompted a lot of discussion. It was interesting to see kind of what people's thoughts were um, against kind of what the role itself is in the description. Um, 
had a session, we've got a session coming up actually on engagement and engaging with stakeholders and others. Um, we had a session probably a couple of weeks ago on visualisation. So it's one of those things that it's not everyone's cup of tea, but we've got some really good visual senior BAs in our organisation who use um, different techniques and pictures and um, infographics, etc., to get their message across with some interesting results. So they were sharing some of that. It's kind of another added thing that um, people looking to be seniors can kind of think, well, actually, that's something else I could look at doing um, to get my message across. I think Jamie's already mentioned um, the session with Tammy on empowerment, which went, went down really well. Um, it was a very popular one. Um, and it's really important to our seniors that they do feel empowered and that they can, you know, make those decisions themselves and we're not dictating what they use and how they do it. Um, so a big one for us. Um, community, I mentioned the different initiatives. So lots of different community initiatives people can get involved in or they can kind of come up with their own ideas. And then finally, at the top, I feel like I'm talking at high speed here, <laughs> I'm seeing the big picture. So that's a very civil service term, um, but it just means that you haven't kind of got that narrow mindset where you only kind of know what's going on within your existing team. It just means that you're kind of looking broader, you kind of understand that the things that are going on, whether it be in other teams um, that you work with, or maybe in policy or wider government, things that might impact what you do and things that you should be aware of. Um, so it's just having that, that broader view, not thinking just narrow. Okay, that's that one. Next one, Jamie. Okay, so I think we've probably covered a lot of this already, just to say that we built a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring network, so existing senior BAs matched with um, the, the BAs on the um, senior development programme, a bit of a two-way relationship, so they're both getting things out of it. Um, and it's just good to, after the sessions, for them to be able to talk through some of their ideas with their mentor and some of their ideas for where they want to develop. And some of those mentors have really taken on board some of the things and kind of got them involved in different things that they might not have done previously. Some of them have on their interview panels and all kinds. So um, it's been very um, a positive experience so far from what we've the feedback we've had. Um, so definitely something we'll incorporate again. Okay. Next one. Okay, I think we've covered this one, Jamie. So I think we're we're kind of unless there's anything you want to add on this one, I think we're <laughs> okay. And over no. to you. Thank you. Yeah, I think on the mentor, I think we've pretty much covered it. I think if we do a slide, so yeah. Um, so I think what, one of the things that we really put a lot of time um, into at the beginning is trying to reassure people what it was, but also what it wasn't the program. Um, so one of the things that we made a big deal of at the beginning is obviously ensuring people saw this and, and made sure they saw it and it was promoted in such a way that this was a development program, was something that was centered around someone's learning development, but also didn't guarantee a job at the end of it. Um, so how we work in civil services, we can't just promote someone based on doing a set number of things. We have to go through an open and fair recruitment um, exercise, and that involves opening up to external people as well as internal people. But obviously what we're looking to do is make sure that people at least have this or aware of the skills or the gaps uh, and identify further areas to their own development or maybe even alternative roles possibly as well. So when they do come to apply for those, they're better equipped uh, both in their application, but also if they're successful in getting them. Um, we're not typically teaching sort of a lot of the technical BA skills uh, through this programme. Um, so there's some bits around bringing together disparate sets of analysis we've been touching on, um, which is that more elevation uh, piece. But some of those core BA um, technical skills, we still have other avenues for that and they're open to all. Um, we didn't want to duplicate that or try and make this a bigger programme it needed to be because the majority of our people that have come through um, onto this programme are already very, very experienced business analysts um, working on a variety of different things. Um, and the other thing is, it's this is a this is a programme that's run alongside people's jobs. So what it wants us to do is get get the buy-in from different areas. And I think this is a question actually on one of the on one of the QA wise uh, Q, on, on the chat coming up. Um, so um, we, we wanted to make sure people were a doing this, were doing it alongside a day job, but also that the areas they're working in really supported giving them that time to do this alongside their day job. So it wasn't something they did 
Friday evening and Saturday morning. It was something they did actually built into their working week. Um, and we tried to make sure that was really clear that this wasn't like a extracurricular sort of program you had to do in your own time. Yes, there might be bits you have to do in your own time, of course, but the core of it is very much built into your working week. Um, application process. Um, Sally? Yes, I mean, we won't cover this as much because a lot of it won't mean anything when we ran this into obviously a lot of the application process was of a lot of interest, but basically what we did was we wanted people to show that they were really interested and committed to being on the programme, so we asked them to just write a little, what we, it's almost like a, an expression of interest they class it as, so just to say that you're interested and these are the reasons why you think you'd be suited to being on the development programme. It wasn't a big ask, it was just kind of thinking about what you, would, you wanted to get out of the programme and what you could bring to it. Um, it wasn't like a full on job application by any means, but it just helped us kind of think about who was really ready and who was committed um, to the time time that we were asking. Um, and we just asked that they got their line manager or the area that they're working in to approve that just so that we knew they had that um, commitment from the team as well that they could come onto this development programme and be given the time and the space to actually commit to it. Um, so we we asked that they submitted those. We had a number of different applicants, um, more than oh, we had spaces. So we just had a had to sift through, had to think about actually are these people ready for it yet? What, what are they going to bring to it? And that was really the process for applying and being put onto it. It's fairly simple. <laughs> okay, Jamie, you um, yeah, so just lastly, um, I think we've, we've run this internally, so there's a couple, these last two slides probably more um, focused for internal audience, but um, we, we've had a lot of interest from the from in the programme from both inside and outside DWP, so I know internally inside DWP, our um, head of delivery management, uh, my peer Barry Trace, um, he's really interested in something quite similar for the senior delivery managers and how they can develop them, and some of those things actually are transferable in this programme, obviously some are very, very different. Uh, and I, I also know the user research profession um, is also taking an interest in it. Um, externally, we've been talking to a couple of um, different organisations outside of government um, who, are, who are interested in finding out more and seeing how they can run that, including a major bank and a, a big university. So we, we've been quite surprised about how um, interested people have been. Uh, we, we think there is a gap and hence why we've put this together ourselves. Um, Hence why we're quite keen to come and share this today with people. And I think both to share it, if people are interested, this is not something we're trying to monopolize and you know commercialize. Obviously, we're happy to share this if it helps others. Uh, but also similarly, if people are looking or interested to speak on future programs um, and be one of our guest speakers, then we'd love to hear from you for that as well. I thought we'd need to get that plug in, Ali. Um, and similarly, you know, we're really happy um, if you do decide to run it to come and speak at some of those with myself, Ali. Um, or other people in DVP um, or across government, we can, can also arrange um, to come and speak at uh, your own programme if you decide to do your own. Um, so the last slide says Q&A. Um, I can see we've got lots and lots of questions coming up in the chat. I'm conscious Ali and I are also big talkers uh, and we've taken a big chunk there. And Matthew's already got off his chair and walking around, so he's looking quite restless. Um, but um, so what we're going to do, we'll come back to the questions, um, we'll come back to the questions at the end um, after um, Matthew and Emily have um, done the presentation, AO.com. I'm looking forward to the jingle, by the way. You're looking forward for a long time. Paul. Yeah, it's it. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Cheers. Over to you, Emily and Matthew. Well. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? Well, tell him off. Come on, be nice to him. I was. I meant more of it, like a question. Do you, do, do you it's want? Sounded, it's slightly passive aggressive, Emily, but I will. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Um, Sorry, it's the mank accent. Blame that. I'm really not passive aggressive. People assume that, and I'm really not. <laughs> no, we're really messing. We're really messing. Yeah, I've, I've, the, the, the screen is not being shared over to you. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for that. Um, so we thought we'd just start with introductions before Matt gets started. So hello, um, I'm Emily Rawlinson. So I'm lead business analyst at AO.com for our retail um, estate. So predominantly, predominantly looking after all things business analysis, the people, processes, 
um, and whatever else for our e-commerce, um, customer experience, data, and our mobile estate. So um, we're, we're, we're both quite um, spread thin at the moment in terms of what we look after. Um, but absolutely love it. I've been there just over five years um, and it's the people that kind of keep me there really, um, which we'll kind of see when, when we go through how we keep our culture. Matt, do you want to do yours? I would. Um, my name's Matthew. My last name does sound very similar to the firm that I work for. They changed the name two weeks after I joined. I'm still getting over it. Um, I'm not in any way associated with the director. Thanks a lot for that, John. Um, so quick hands up. So I, I have to admit, uh, I like set, told a set of porcupines to James, said that this would probably take five to ten minutes. It's just a, a boundless lie that we told because Emily and I did it and it took 23 minutes. So apologies. Um, we'll try and get through this as quickly as possible. But um, <laughs> I think it was Ali who mentioned about storytelling. And Emily and I were on a course uh, week before last on storytelling. So we thought we would try and do this without PowerPoint, but try to tell you a bit of a story. Um, and what I'll do is I'll post the, um, the mapping session that we did into chat, and then you can have a laugh at our poor attempt at trying to tell stories. So I think that the, probably the first place to start off, this is not an advert for AO. Um, we're now gonna sound like it is an advert for AO, but apologies, bear with us, but what I wanna do is try and set the scene. So AO as a company is quite values led already. And we're talking about culture. I suppose if you're trying to retain a culture or trying to keep it going, then if you've got a rubbish culture, then you're starting in a different place than if you've got a strong culture. AO was very, very focused on doing things that make Nan proud and trying to be doing the right things at the right time. So it was very empowered and, and really nice place to work. The tech or the IT department was very similar. Um, the directors had the doors open, come and see them. Everybody deals with people on a personal level. We may say things to directors that we shouldn't do because we're a little bit too candid with them, but it gives a nice environment. And then finally, the community that we work in, it, what, the thing that's front and center for ourselves are our values. We want to be transparent, we want to be honest, we want to be committed, we want to do things for charity, we want to try and live our values at every time. So culture is a big thing for us because um, without it, I think that we, we really would be less of a place to work in. Yeah. Agreed. And um, pre-COVID, we already did a lot of that stuff. So like, like Matt said, the culture was kind of at the center of, of everything we did. So for example, we recruit based on those values. So anyone who, who's involved in our recruitment process, our, um, our set expectations around what we're looking for, because like Matt said, you know, we're a we like to focus on the work, but we also like to have a bit of fun um, in the workplace. So, so from my perspective, we might like to make sure that that's suited for everyone. You know, everyone likes to have a laugh at work. Some people like to be really, really work driven, which is absolutely fine, but probably won't get on with me and Matt um, day to day. So we like to make sure that, you know, everyone's suited um, and, and kind of as we grow. So I think Matt was the third BA, I think I was the seventh. As we grew, we realized that it was BAs farming in retail, fulfillment, um, and they were split across Bolton, Manchester and Crewe. So we were already kind of building a community that was very disconnected so we thought you know how can we make sure that as a business and as a community that 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 we stick to those values and it becomes quite a, a strong thing so we introduced community days so that means that every every eight weeks every ba got together in person in manchester we retrospectively looked at how things went um, what went well what didn't went well what didn't went well what didn't go well um, and things that we want to try um, for next time and and that was kind of a, basically in those eight week blocks with the idea being that we didn't just focus on the work stuff we are we are we're up there we built up the like community values as well so we every lunch time we went out for food that we got up we would go after for a beer afterwards if people wanted to do that obviously not everyone wants to drink but it was always a good chunk of us that tried to you know keep that social aspect um aspect going which was really important so those community days were um both team building and both the social aspect of, of how we embedded um, our values into the community really. Um, and just a side note, just to show how our values kind of um, spread into the BAs, one of our BAs actually set up a mentoring program. So that was to upskill both BAs inside the community and external, so within the business. And we actually saw people come through um, from other, other walks of life um, into the BA community as junior BAs, which was absolutely brilliant. So we actually started to find other people who had our values and you know the the drive to hopefully um build those up and we've seen some really good um people um off the back of that um so just to kind of touch on we also looked at off the back of the community days one of the idea was to help drive the community forward so we didn't just want it to be me and matt talking to everyone all the time and being the ones that we say right let's go and do this we wanted the 
the, the team to help drive that forward as well. So we wanted to make sure that the actions were followed up. We realized soon quite quickly that when you meet for eight weeks and then book in the next next eight week meeting, no one was speaking in between. So we actually introduced daily, well, three three stand-ups a week for the BAs. Um, and that was face to face, if you could be there, round a board, putting your face on a ticket and moving it through. You know, we love post-its as BAs. And um, with the idea being that we could, you know, make sure that we we're still adding that value. Um, and to touch on the, the the development side of it as well, we didn't just want it to be focused on values, you know, that's important, but we also like to push people. Um, you know, it's part of our values to be driven. So we had um everyone has to at least has to have at least one fortnightly one-to-one. They have to have a personal development plan, you know, it's quite important, but again, on them to drive it forward, just to make sure that we had a safe and supportive space. So we were recruiting on the culture, we were making sure we had embedded values, but we also wanted to make sure that people felt safe and supported, um, which is something that I think, you know, we've always done quite well. Um, and just to know, uh, we weren't remote first at all in any of this. Everything we did and everything that I just spoke about then was face-to-face. Um, all decisions were made in the office. If there was a decision to be made, there was no phone call. You were in the office and you were around a table making that decision. So this was a massive culture shock to us to make sure that we kept that going forward. But all in all, we were, we were in a good place kind of pre-COVID. Yeah, and then, then COVID happened, which kind of ruined everything for everybody, as far as we were concerned. <laughs> um, we went and worked remote the, about the week before the, the great announcement in March. So we suddenly found out that we had no corridor conversations. There were no chats between people that you didn't normally see. Suddenly our um, calendars had a virus of a different type because there was meetings back to back. Everybody seemed to want something, but nobody wanted to talk anymore. It was, it was not a particularly nice and pleasant place to live in. Worse still was I couldn't use post-it notes for anything because there was nobody to read them. And we weren't particularly um, evolved enough to have used Miro or Miro, sorry. Um, so we were, we were kind of fumbling around and making things up as we went along. The one thing that we found out that we've, there were a lot of people suddenly getting very, very tired. So there was um, something that told me a couple of months ago that for every hour that you spend on a VC, it's like spending an hour driving a car, which meant that by the end of Thursday and Friday, all of us were completely and utterly shattered. And the best thing was, we also went through the biggest growth period of our company ever. So we were, we were stressed, we were burnt out, and we needed to get more and more people, and we need to figure out how to do this remotely. Um, I can only say, while we were in a good place beforehand, we definitely, definitely, definitely were in a good place then. So that's when we started to think about what things we could start to do, which is possibly the bit that you want to get to. Yeah. Definitely. And so we we wanted to start small. We didn't want to, you know, start to rework everything, but we know we had some um, some problems to fix. And obviously as BAs, we listed our our problem statements and let's go after the most important one. So we wanted to still see people and we wanted to feel like people were connected. So we we, we reworked our stand-ups and how frequent they were. So we made them every day. So that meant at nine o'clock every morning we were seeing the BAs. You know, you could um you could still have that connection and that social aspect that um that we were missing from the office. Um basically we got into the habit of you know seeing everyone for breakfast stood by the the tea point and we'd lost that so bringing these stand-ups daily meant that it, it brought it back um we also introduced a rotor we didn't want it to again just be me and matt um talking to, to all the bas and um, within the community daily so we give people the opportunity to you know come and run it yourself so everyone um has two days every so often i think it's 26 months now so you don't have it that often i think mine's next in august which is brilliant um but you know you you, you come on and you leave that you leave that day and you make sure that people are unlifted um and, and part and basically re, re-energized um as part of that we also introduced themes and onto the stand-up so previously in the office they were very work focused and like i said we lost that social aspect so um, twice a week we introduce daily chats so they're literally just chats and sometimes someone comes up i think one person brought once a picture of a giraffe that had a giraffe where where'd you put the bow tie and i think we had a 15 minute discussion on that but just to keep that social aspect there and not always be so work focused um, but on the the work focused days which was the biggest i think change for us was introducing health scores so we asked everyone how they were out of 10 
Um, and we tracked that. We could see where people were, were lifted up, where people were down, and we could manage that. One thing we didn't like to do was track people's metrics. You know, how many user stories have you written whilst you've been sat at home? That's not important to us. We trust our community. We trust our people. So for us, tracking their happiness and how supported they feel meant that, you know, if, if they're happy, they'll, they'll go and do what we expect of them. If they're not, we can work with them to try and lift them back up to get them to back to the potential that, that we expect. So and that was really important for us and something that we've carried on. And I think we will. Um, we will carry on for the foreseeable. Um, obviously, we were now virtual behind laptops. We didn't have a physical board anymore. Like Matt said, we had no post-its. So we had to move to a Kanban board on Teams, which actually worked really well. Um, one thing I don't think we realised before is how um, the people in Manchester, our crew might have felt when they weren't at Bolton to see the, the board. So actually it meant that everyone was inclusive and we had full transparency of everything that was going on, which was absolutely brilliant for the first time. Um, and it was really great to see people we're putting the faces on a ticket, bringing it in and helping drive forward um, the stuff that we wanted to, to bring in, even, even sat at home. Um, and obviously the biggest point was our community days. We had those in person in Manchester um, every time um, and moving to remote community days was the first for us. So we had to think about um, how we did that, how we kept everyone energised. Um, and again, we introduced a rotor just as always. So there's two different people leading it every time. So it's not always the same people. And our biggest learning with that is that Teams isn't catered for big um, big groups of people in a room at once. So we actually started to use Zoom because when you're on Zoom to a 26 people, you can see every single person, which meant that people felt engaged. You could see where people were up to. You could see people's um, lack of engagement or facial expressions, people laughing. And it was really nice to just see everyone's kind of, it was almost like you were in the room with each other, which was absolutely lovely. Um, something that we, we still do now. Um, and to carry that on, you know, we'd, we would never done this before. We were quite social. Uh, we did a lot of things together. So we introduced things that weren't very work related. So we have cook alongs on a Tuesday. So we all put our laptops in the kitchen, get food um, pre prehand and just cook together. Um, not saying that we're all um, to be chefs, but you know, we, we manage. Matt's better than I am definitely. He's usually cooked by the time I've chopped my veg, but it's great just to have that non-work aspect. You know, you see it, you see into people's personal lives as well, which is absolutely lovely. I don't think I would have met Matt's daughters if it wasn't for fixing things like that, which I, which I'm really grateful for. It's, it's absolutely lovely. And we also had a games night as well, you know, monthly games night. People can join up, play some Among Us, Quibitch if you've never heard it, and um, some really, really brilliant online games. Um, and you know, this was all new to us. None of us had ever done virtual games nights or cooked along in a kitchen on a laptop. So it was a nice feeling to feel that we were all newbies together, not just our um, our new starters. You know, we were all going through this, and it, it, it was nice. Um, and then just to quickly touch on how we then made sure people still felt safe and supported. Obviously, I touched on that um, in, in the introduction. We increased one to one, so people had to have a one to one um, every week, and that wasn't to keep track on people. That was to make sure that people felt like they had a focused time to go and speak to their support um, support network, whether that be their mentor, mentor or line manager. But what we, we didn't want to do was add to the calendar fatigue that we were seeing. So we said to people, try and encourage walking one-to-ones with your line managers. So put your laptop down, pick up the phone, put your headphones in and go for a walk and have those conversations. And we actually found that that, that was really well received. So something that we, we still push people to do now, obviously, we don't know when we're going back to the office. So we still do them and it, it's, it's lovely to see actually um and i guess underpinning that it's all just making it about the people and um, everything we tried to do was to focus on the people it wasn't around um outputs as such and you know um were people still going to the requirements workshops we know that's happening um it was about people's well-being so we also brought in a well-being coach um, for a day to do some um do some training around that stuff and how to think about yourself and headspace and all that all that great stuff which was which was brilliant and it just made sure that we were still protecting our culture um off the back of that um, and one thing to mention that I am going to send out is throughout all of this, we actually started to create a BA Canvas. What we wanted to do was everyone else in the, to, in the community to reflect on what our values were, um, you know, what was our mission still, um, and so that we could go back to something and reflect on something that everyone had had input to. So we found that was really, really well, well received. And we even talked through our BA values in that. Um, and it was brilliant. And it's a great visual that we've got stored. So one thing me and Matt are going to do after this is send a bit of a pack with some of this stuff in, some of our talking points, and that BA canvas is in there, and um, which you can kind of see how, how we built that through through lockdown as a as a homage to our culture. Oh, flip, it's me again. Right, let's answer your questions. Um... 
so we got to the point where we were just kind of getting the hang of it. Um, everybody here was really, really looking forward to Christmas. I don't know if you remember that. It felt like <laughs> it was going to be all right. A wonderful place. You anyway, know, when we came back from Christmas, everything wasn't all right. It was flipping awful. Somebody invented January and February, which is a rubbish time of year. And for all of us, we really, really struggled. We thought we'd not cracked it and we really hadn't. Um, now, Emily, myself and the other project leads who uh, work with us, we realized that quite quickly that things weren't working well. So I wanted to try and um, try and take a moment and understand why we we're lacking engagement. So people weren't spending time on the PDPs, they were getting overwhelmed by work, didn't want to speak as much. So we thought what we could do first was trying to set an example. So rather than telling people to open up or trying to talk about their problems or challenges, we thought we'd try and open communication levels up. So the first thing we did was we introduced uh, beer campfires. So every two weeks we get together of the 26 beers in you know, groups of 50% each and we'll do a quick ceremony of anything that's happened in the world, what positions we're recruiting for, things like that, but also gives them 15 minutes, 20 minutes to bring any challenges that they've got. So as peer group, we can try and help each other. We also created a monthly town halls. So this is where, as a management team, it's all very well and good. Sometimes you forget that you're supposed to be contributing to the actual community yourself. So we set a, a set of OKRs for ourselves, and then we have, we're held accountable by the community so they can see that we're earning our, our peg. We also want to try and make it more personal. So we're, we're a product-based um, development house. So what we wanted to do was try and use the quality product reviews as a way for people to re-engage with their PDPs. It also meant that we were trying to increase the importance of the PDPs because the QPI is really important to us. It's a template that everybody was used, and it also took the responsibility away from the line manager and made it personal driven. We found a lot more people becoming more engaged with their personal development plans and more willing to talk about them. Up until this point, people kept the PDPs like the homework from the fifth form that somebody wanted to copy. Now you've got people who are willing to talk about their journeys, which is really nice and very, very empowering for them. Um, I think the, the final thing really as well, AO, as we've touched on, can sometimes be a little bit anarchic. We do things that are really, that can be fun. Um, I remember flamethrowers being in the office once. So we, we start, I mean, the word fun committee really doesn't really spring to mind when you're thinking about fun and committees, but apparently it works. So we sent out Easter eggs, we're having a sports day in a month or so, COVID regulations allowing. We wanted to try and bring a little bit of the humor back rather than like Emily said, as let's go and deliver yet another initiative that we really wanted to within five minutes ago. We also wanted to show a little bit of gratitude. So we work with some amazing people who sometimes are completely undersold. So we wanted their peers to nominate them for awards. We announce them every month. We, they don't get a prize. It's the cheapest morale thing ever. Um, but it's really, really humbling to hear all the stories. Um, and occasionally people write about me, which it means I feel really awkward about it and start crying and we have to gloss over very quickly. The crux of it all is we are definitely trying to make this work. Um, we are a long way from being anywhere near to doing well. We want to keep getting better. Um, we've learned that if you give people the right environment, give them the right moral support, then that drives your culture. Um, we've used our own BA skills. We, we don't like problems. It really annoys probably everybody on this call. So using all the techniques that we learned to go and deliver Project X seemed like a good way to try and figure out problem B. Um, I'm a huge fan of collaboration. I think as a team, we can accomplish things far more than individuals. So we, we learned very quickly that the quickest way to earn trust was to be honest with people. So if I'm struggling, if I'm not in a great place, I tell people. And if they want to share, then that's great as well. Um, and I mean, we've, we've, we've got so many challenges ahead, it's unbelievable. We have not figured out how to do remote first. Our office does not work for it. It's got noise pollution everywhere. There's so many challenges that um, uh, if anybody's got any tips, I am genuinely looking forward to hearing them all. That's it. Oh, sorry, Emily, you're now going to do a right. professional press. Nice segment. Uh, it was literally, 
Thank, thanks if anyone's got any questions or if anyone's got any similarities that they've seen or tips that they've got then we'd love to hear them you know we've we've just winged a lot of this and tried to just put people first so if anyone has got any tips around um around this stuff then please share we, we'd, we'd we'd be up for hearing about them thank you very much for that guys really 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 insightful both ao and and dwp um Thank you for the questions. There's loads that have come in, so I suppose we've got 20 minutes left. As BAs, I know we could probably be here until 10 o'clock tonight answering questions, but I'm sure we want to enjoy the rest of the sun. So what I'll do is just quickly read them out, kind of direct them around, or anyone if just wants to chip in, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get the questions answered. Um, so Tom asked on the, the, the first, first presentation, given that DWP follow an agile delivery model, do you have a separate product owner and BA role? If so, how does the dynamic of the relationship work between BA and PO? And I know Christina at Cavea had a similar uh, question when we spoke on the phone, that how do the BA and the product owner work together if you do have them? Yeah, so I'm happy, I'm happy to obviously answer that been about DDBP um, and Ali, of course, feel free to chip in. Um, so for us, we have quite um, well-defined product owner and BA roles um, and every, or well, pretty much is always got an exception, but every product of each team has its own dedicated product owner and business analyst and obviously other, uh, other roles as well. Um, I think we could probably fill a good session on it if I'm honest. I think it's a, it's a big topic, so I'll try and cover it very, very quickly. is isn't my forte, but I'll try. Um, in short, the dynamic works really well. I think the secret to it is having those really clearly defined job descriptions. And we've also put a lot of time and energy into various roles, in, into looking at how they work with each other. Um, if I'm honest, the product owner hasn't been too contentious for us. Um, user researchers in particular has been a hot one in the past um and um, service design is probably another one which is quite a hot one for us at the moment um but we've done a lot of work with peers in in, in, the, in other professions to um to you know to, to demonstrate what best practice looks like and to um and to put that in place whether that's writing blogs speaking at various events i know ali you've spoken at previous events uh, including the european ba conference on how bas and news researchers work together um, but for us, in short, the BA and PA relationship works really, really well, but I think clear um, job descriptions, but I think more than that, a clear sort of accepted sort of understanding in the culture, in the teams of what those roles do um, is, is a success to it. Or for yeah, yeah I, I've definitely seen that. It's, the, it's people understanding the role, because when BAs don't understand the PO role and vice versa, it, yeah, I feel like it um, causes a bit of friction. Um, so, Tor, to everyone, this is another a popular question as well. Do you have a toolbox of techniques for BAs to pick from? Would you stick to the same tool for each bit of work, e.g. same process mapping techniques like BPM, MN, UML, stuff like that? So, kind of toolkits, techniques? I'm, I'm quickly happy to answer the DVP perspective again. Um, so, we... We do have a toolbox. Um, so we have a toolbox of recommended techniques. Um, like I said, we don't mandate techniques as such, but it's very much a toolbox we can go into. Um, and this is what best practice looks like, but feel free to tweak, tweak and, and tailor it to suit what you're working on. So some business areas will very much fully adopt, um, uh, you know, or, or most of our business areas actually adopt light and notation frameworks and people in um, because most of our stakeholders can't consume it and it just has confusion. Um, so we have a, an informal sort of beef men and light, which, which works well. Um, and we've also put a lot of time and energy into um, other techniques, like visualization techniques. Um, so yes, rich pictures, infographics, but also things like Picablo to convey processes uh, and convey how things work to, to get buy-in or to, um, to, to seek input. Um, that's, I think that's it from, from DVP. I don't know if Ali, you've got anything? Has Ali gone actually? No, I am here. I've had to turn my camera off. I think uh, I think the kids upstairs are using most of the bandwidth for various computer games. So <laughs> everyone started to sound like robots, so I couldn't keep up. <laughs> you missed some of the questions. So um, yeah, I'm sure you've covered it, Jamie. <laughs> I'll just stick with that. <laughs> um, so from Jade, I think you might have covered this, but do you have a similar program for entry level BAs then who want to become a BA from other roles or areas of the business? 
that for us? Sorry. I think, yeah, DS, I think all these first ones are. Yeah, I think it was yeah. covered um, about five minutes after I posted it. So, oh, right. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yeah, it's, we've got the apprenticeship and we will look to do further ones if there's demand and if we think it's right at some point. But at the moment, we're concentrating on the senior one. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's that's fine. And and how did you identify and approach BA professionals from outside the DWP then to, to speak and, and how did they react? M mainly bribery, um, <laughs> occasionally beers. Uh, it depends on our relationship with them. Um, no, we no, I mean obviously working for the government, we can't use words like bribery. Um, so no, in, in all spaces, we use our own network of people and um, people like Tammy. Um, personally known for, for a while um, so sent a smiley face whatsapp I think and, 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 and secure it that way but for most other people we've tended to do it on the agreement where if you're happy to come and talk in events um, with ours we, we're happy to reciprocate and um, that's tended to work best for us um, and I, so I can see as a question later on I think from um, I think from from Matthew as well and you know we'd, let's get in contact separately we'd love love for you to come and talk and, and anyone else, Emily, and anyone else too, to come talk at one of our events, and, and we'd love to come and talk at one of yours too, if if there's opportunity to. No, cool. Um, so, so what's the difference then, Jade? asks again, what's the difference between your senior and lead BA roles? Then that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Good start, Ali. Yeah. So, okay, so our senior. So we're going to add add complication because we've got two different types of lead. So that might just throw it into the mix as well. So our seniors um, work within a function. Um, they typically work maybe across a couple of different teams, um, supporting the other BAs within there. Um, and then our leads, so we have functional leads. So for example, we've got one functional lead across the whole of health. So they kind of oversee all of the different work that's coming in across that whole function. So it's, it's an even bigger sort of more elevated role, kind of looking across everything, we work very close um, some of them work very closely on some of the strategy things that are coming in, um, very closely with lead um, product managers. Um, so that's generally the functional one. So it's just, it's kind of higher and more responsibility, I guess, is kind of the, the difference. Um, and then we have practice leads like myself who entirely different kind of work on much more of the um, recruitment and community building and development of people. So different again. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, it does, yeah. <laughs> um, so Victoria asks, how are you coaching others on on the mentoring relationship? Is it focused on day-to-day -day work activities or more career-focused or both? Um, so we've got various different mentoring sort of networks and, and um, sort of schemes in place across the organisation. But for the scope of the Senior BA Development Programme, um, the mentors have been particularly chosen as experienced senior business analysts or experienced practitioners. Um, and the scope of that relationship is predominantly focused on, on, on career and development, so less on day-to-day -day work activities. Um, naturally, sometimes some of those kind of things can come up, particularly if someone's got a mentor and they maybe haven't got other mentors or they haven't got a, you know, a wide network or just one that they've got a good relationship and just want to soundboard some things with different people. Uh, but the main focus is very much career focused and their own development. Um, obviously there's a two-way thing in that because obviously then the mentors are also developing their mentoring skills um, but also they're then finding out about different parts of the organisation as well and, um, and what other people are working on. Yeah, good question from Kay here and, and feel free for anyone to chip in on, on this because it's obviously topical and everyone will have done things differently. How did you adapt your training approach to remote online working? I imagine everyone's had a, a different approach to that. I've, I've got probably something on that one. So I'm, I'm Paul Glover from a, a day sec and um, I, um, business analysis is quite new to our business. It's not something we've um, they've traditionally had. So it's all been about training individual people as well as uh, training the business as a whole about what we do, which in a remote environment has been uh, interesting. Um, so I've been experimenting with uh, building a quick website in Google Sites, uh, which is business analyst team. if anyone's interested, um, which just kind of gives our individual team like ways of working and um, different videos to look at about techniques, as well as, um, you know, explaining to the business as a whole what it is we do in each of the different areas. Thanks for that, Paul. No, that's, that's interesting. We, you could send that round and, and we could check out that, that website to, to have a look. 
So then from Mark, did you need to get buy-in from the business to run this program? And, and is it a challenge to support the program alongside all the, the project work? Just, yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly come on to the question from Kay again before, if that's okay, James. I'll go on, yeah. Uh, the training approach. I think it's just, just something that we've actually seen, which has been more of a positive, actually, um, on moving to more remote online um, training um, is that, We've had a number of people that actually couldn't get to face-to-face -to -face events in the past um, due to either where they live and it being such a long journey and then ultimately not being able to spend time away from home due to childcare commitments or other commitments. So we've actually seen a, a bigger take-up in, in training, which, is, which has been interesting for us. Um, because we'd like to say we've attracted people that may have been put off by going to three-day classroom events or whatever before. Um, but yeah, to, to Mark's question on getting by to run this program yeah we we, we we got in contact with various directors in each of our sort of lines of business or different benefit lines of business um, to get that support um that people actually had the time to do this alongside their day job and that, that was a really important prerequisite for us that we had in place before them running the program and realizing that half the people in different parts of business could get the time and half couldn't so we wanted to make sure that was in place for all um, irrespective of where people were working in so it, it required some interesting conversations. We had to really sell the programme. Um, we had to really sell why it was a worthwhile thing to do, particularly to directors who were going, well, I'm going to lose so-and-so now, X amount of hours um, every week or every month. Um, but that's how we focused it. And that, that's how it was really important for us to make sure it was a fair thing, but also that people had the time to get the most out of it. Yeah, cool. Um, so I think that's all the questions from the first presentation. So moving on to, to, to AO. So Jade asked... How have you kept up with the community stroke social activities whilst working remotely? I think you probably covered that. I think I was a bit premature. And <laughs> oh, was it again? Sorry, that's, that's me not listening. You're you're able to preempt our entire talk. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only thing we missed was obviously we we were doing the obligatory quizzes for a while, and it just got a bit tedious. So we looked at other things like the cook-alongs, like the games night. Um, just to keep people talking um, and now obviously we can go outside people are starting to meet in bubbles in safe bubbles so a few people are going to play hall in Wigan on, on Friday um, and obviously we're playing a sports day in July so trying to do things outdoors do things that are safe and for people to, to get together with. Um, and I think that's all the questions now but an interesting one that I know that came up quite a lot when I've been speaking to people beforehand is how everyone's onboarding people remotely and, and how are they um and how are they making that work do you know because obviously someone who's never stepped foot in the culture in the office before covid somebody who's literally purely joining remotely how was how have people been dealing with that i think what, what i found out i did sorry this is from myself is you, you need to prepare you need to create structure um when we've tried to wing it before and we failed miserably um, so the BA community put together a starting pack, so we try and give them quite a lot of structure in the first couple of weeks, make sure the line manager's got enough time to dedicate to them, create buddies, so they've got people to bounce off of and not feel like you're bothering somebody, which is sometimes how you felt when you were in an office, so it's even worse when you're sat in your own spare bedroom or wherever it be. So create structure and prepare and make that person the priority. If you don't, if you undersell them, then unfortunately you reap the benefit later on. Yeah, you need a lot of engagement, we found, from, from the support um, network that we've got. So in the first few weeks, it's daily catch-ups um, with the line manager, making sure that we've got a meet and greet list to go and book people in so the are meeting key people, having the overview sessions that you might take for granted that um, you might not do in the office because you just assume things, people will pick things up. Um, so, so for me, it was the communication side of it and making sure that um felt like someone was there uh, throughout it all. Yeah. Who else has onboarded recently then who maybe have maybe has a, a, an insight into how they've onboarded people remotely in, in their organisations and, and what might have, have been able to be done better or what went really well? We've, um, we've, we've recruited about 60 of people since uh, COVID began just in business analysis alone. So we've had to react quite quickly from honest onboarding people um, and a little bit complicated our organisation set up. Um, but we've sort of almost got three layers of how you onboard. You onboard them into the organisation, you onboard them into the area of the business you're working in, into the team and area, and then you onboard them into the profession um, and community of practice. So on the profession and community of practice side, we've 
tried to get, um, well, we've run a couple so far, uh, quite large events welcoming people um, to A, build up the networks, B, to then find out what other people are working on around the organisation at quite a high level, uh, but then also see, show people what kind of things we've got going off in the community, uh, what kind of issues we have, um, what kind of things we can get involved in, how they can see, can find support, what channels we've got and how we communicate um, and network as a community. Um, and then similarly, um, we've also, um, we've also then tried to buddy people up as much as we can, um, which is something we did before, but I think has become even more important um, since COVID, um, particularly like you say, when people are at home and they've not got that natural social interaction. Um, so we, we try to do those kind of things. Ali, I don't know if there's anything else, which... Um, not... No, sorry, I thought it was on me. Um, not really. Um, I think just actually to note that some of the things that we've done, like Jamie's talked about the big sessions there, actually, for the community and introducing people to our practice, we'll probably carry on doing um, in the future because it's quite hard when you're all kind of trying to do things differently in different hubs and you've got kind of different experiences for people. So actually, whilst people still get their inductions in their local sort of teams and areas, actually, as a practice, it's quite good for us to be able to do something um, across all the new starters so they get to meet each other and they all get the same kind of message. So, yeah, it's been quite positive, really. <laughs> yeah. What about managing people back to the office in a, for example, if we could think of a world in maybe two years, two years time, whatever that might look like, do you think most places will keep a three days remote, two days in the office, fully remote, everyone going back to the office? What, what's everyone's plans with that and how are you going to manage it? I think it has to go remote first, like industry standards now within tech is that people are, you know, they want in that remote, um, that remote work life. So I think if businesses that haven't got it, I think they've got to take a good look at what they're offering to be able to keep, I think, a workforce happy. And then people have got very used to, you know, that, that balance. So I, I think it's, it's going to be an interesting one. I think all the dogs have been uh, getting together as well, haven't they, to make sure that happens. <laughs> I know my Spaniel, I think, would be... Uh, heartbroken if I wasn't at home or maybe she's really happy actually maybe I'm just really misjudging it I don't know but imagine yeah, the time I'm when, when, oh, sorry I was gonna say can you imagine a time when you used to go I'm not going to come into the office because I have a dog yeah. <laughs> or oh, at that point that's, that's my excuse <laughs> and I grew up in a time when you did what you were told and it's this the idea I can't come in today I need to sit my dog I'm sorry I've got a lab that's a year old and if it'd kill me if I went outside for longer than an hour. Yeah. Sorry, I've talked over something. I do apologise. No, it's all right. I was just going to say, I was just very much being run on a on a personal. If you want to go back in the office, you can go back in the office when you need to or when the client needs you to be in the office, looking at it that perspective. But I think most people are just staying, working from home as much as they can because they've got used to it. As you say, everybody, that's where people want to be now. Yeah, that's it. And, it. and it doesn't seem to, I mean, I don't know from your point of view, but it doesn't seem to have affected productivity at all. If, in fact, it might have even made it better and, and it might have finally proved that you, you don't actually need to be behind your desk in a, in a physical place to, to actually do your work. So, I think you've got different types of productivity. If I'm going to be honest, I, I know that I can't stay on a Teams call for long, um, but I, I can run an all-day workshop and I don't feel dead after mm -hmm. um, in person. So yeah. some things that are better, being at home where you can get a little bit of um, quiet and collaborate with a couple of people. Other times it's nice to be in a group and bounce ideas off each other. So but why, why be a one size fits all? Try whatever seems to work best for that time. Just like Jim would talk about uh, this toolkit, don't mandate it. Give people the option and just like Kay's saying, if it fits for you, do it. Go and, go and have fun. Mm -hmm. I know my cats team are very much out. Sorry, go on, Alice. I was just going to say my, my cats are much better um, workmates than the people in the office. They're much better behaved on, on Teams calls. I don't get people constantly talking in the background. So I think I'm going to stick with them in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think unless anyone else has got any other questions, I think we've actually managed to uh, to time it to perfection and, and, and finish on time. But uh, if anyone else has got any questions or if, if they think of any afterwards, feel free to to drop me them over this has been recorded so what i'll do is send it round um to everyone afterwards just so you can kind of look back at it share it with anyone who you feel um it'll benefit 
And yeah, I just want to say thank you again for everyone for, for coming and, and for the guys for presenting and, and taking part. I feel like it's been a, a really good event and I, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you very much, James. Yeah, great event. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for yeah. yeah, well. really good. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.